Imagine if you opened ChatGPT and before you type a word, a single line of text appears. You are standing in an open field west of a white house. Okay, go east. And the computer responds. You are behind the white house. There is a small window that is slightly ajar. Except this isn't ChatGPT. The year is 1980 and you're playing Zork. It's not just any game. It's one of the most important video games in history. No graphics, no sound, just a choose your own adventure. All through text going back and forth with a computer. But the world was hooked because players felt like the computer was intelligent. And even though real artificial intelligence was still 40 years away, Zork found a way to fake it. We're gonna break Zork open to figure out how it pulled off one of the most brilliant deceptions in computer history and how this influenced the modern AI chatbot. But to get there, we have to go back to the beginning. By the way, this episode is sponsored by VoiceFlow. It's what I use to build low-code AI voice agents. You can sign up with the link below for free and the best part is no credit card necessary. And now back to the show. In the 1970s, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was a global center of computer innovation. It was home to some of the most brilliant programmers leading the charge towards AI, while figuring out what that even meant. And just down the hall were our four key players, Tim Anderson, Mark Blank, Bruce Daniels, and Dave Lebling. They were part of the Dynamic Modeling Group, a team who specialized in blending technical expertise with creative storytelling to simulate complex computer systems. They had an ambitious vision. They were gonna build the most complex text adventure game of all time, transporting the player from a simplistic terminal interface to the world of Zork, the great underground empire. There was so much to explore, over a hundred locations where you could find treasure, solve puzzles, fight enemies, and if you got careless, get eaten by a group. And all you needed to control the entire gameplay were straight up plain English sentences. The computer would just understand what you were trying to do. Does that sound familiar to something we have now? There was a huge difference. The Zork team did not have access to large language models and machine learning algorithms. And the entirety of the game code had to be smaller than 100 kilobytes to be playable on personal computers. That's less data than in this one picture right here. So they had to get creative. Anderson, Blank, and Daniels focused on crafting the game narrative, building out the world of Zork with places, paths, characters, items, and a ton of lore. And Lebling took the lead on the notorious Zork parser. This is what gave the computer a way to understand plain English sentences. And by achieving this, it became one of the first examples of what the AI community calls natural language processing. So in the 1970s, how exactly does a computer understand English? Imagine that you're in the driver's seat. Your task is to build a parser that sits between the player and the game logic and connects the two together. To get started, you need to understand what this game actually allows you to do on its most simplistic level. Generally, Zork lets you do two things. You can move to different locations and you can interact with the various things that are in each location. To simplify it even further, the entire gameplay is really just a bunch of actions and objects. See where I'm getting out here? It's just verbs and nouns. This is how your parser is going to, well, parse. It takes a plain English input, like grab the lantern, and matches each word to its meaning. Grab is the verb, or action, and lantern is the noun, or object. The is completely optional. So your parser understands what the player is saying, but that's only half the job done. It's not a one-sided relationship here. The computer needs to say something back. How does that work? Zork puts two concepts in play, Game state and object properties. Game state is straightforward. You'll keep track of and update the player's current location, inventory, and other stats. This is what determines the kinds of objects and actions that you have access to. Object properties are pretty interesting. Every single thing in the Zork world is considered an object. Locations, characters, items, you name it. And each one of them is associated with a list of different actions that can be performed with or on them. For example, keys can unlock doors. They could also be thrown if that was something that you wanted to do. Now in the code, every single action object combo results in a pre-written response. So not only does Zork change the internal game state to reflect what just happened, it also prints this stored response out to the console. The cherry on top is, every single action and object in Zork is also stored with a list of its synonyms to make sure the computer recognizes as wide a range of inputs as possible. 
This is the theory. But what does it look like in practice? Let's attack the troll with the elvish sword. Very daring. First, each word is checked against Zork's massive dictionary to match it to its category. The player is trying to use the sword. Is that object in the player's inventory? Yes, continue. Does the main object, the troll, exist in our location? Yes, it does. Continue. Can we perform the action on this object? Check the troll's properties. Yes, we can. Continue. Finally, does our indirect object, the sword, modify our attack's action? Yes, it does. And this is the end of the line. We filtered all the way down until we got a result. The computer gives us back one line. Your sword crashes down, knocking the troll into dreamland. And this process repeats with every single input. This is what gave Zork the illusion of intelligence. Players don't see any of this stuff happening in the background. They just spoke to the computer in the way that they understood the world. And the computer just got it. And because of this, Zork is cited as a direct inspiration for the design of modern AI agents that give users a natural language interface and get things done behind the scenes. At the time, the magic was very real. Until it wasn't. I'm not saying that Zork wasn't brilliant. It was revolutionary. But the parser itself had big limitations. Yes, it could understand hundreds of verbs and nouns. But the moment that you strayed just a little too far from what the designers expected, the illusion would shatter. Even if, as a player, you had the right instinct, Zork's confident replies often collapsed to, I don't understand that. And it's a very long, complicated game. I love the game for the experience, but I really, really tried beating it, and I just couldn't. Once you start hitting walls in the code enough times, the magic starts wearing thin. And that's why the more adventurous of players often felt boxed in. This was such an expansive, detailed world, and you'd feel like there were endless possibilities. But the computer only had a few of these possibilities pre-written. Zork felt intelligent, until it didn't. But that brings us forward to today. Because if Zork was made now, it would have a hugely unfair advantage. We have transformers, embeddings, massive data sets, reinforcement learning, and real AI. Today, there isn't a single prompt that's outside the script. Real AI improvises, generalizes, adapts. In other words, it does the things that Zork only pretended to do. So do we just chalk the original game up to a fun experience? A good history lesson? Not at all. This episode is to be continued. In the next one, which you'll be able to click on here when it's released, we're gonna bring two worlds together, past and future, combining the legendary world of Zork with real AI. And I'm gonna build it myself. If you enjoy this content, feel free to subscribe and give it a like. If you felt like you learned something cool, share the video to spread the knowledge. All of that helps a ton. And for now, Zork AI will return very soon.